So in today's video, we're not actually going to be making any blocks. We are going to be finishing our sampler quilt. Hi, I'm Tom the Colorblind Quilter and you are watching Behind the Blocks Season 1. Now in the last 12 videos, we have been making blocks that have been based on squares and rectangles with a view to making this lovely sampler quilt that you can see. And we're at the end of making all those blocks and we are ready to finish constructing this quilt top. So in today's video, I am going to be showing you how to do that and sharing some tips to make the process as painless as possible. There is of course a free worksheet in the description below that has all the step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this, as well as the fabric pieces that you will need. And I've also included instructions on the most economical way to make your quilt backing. If you need to catch up on the video series, there's also a free worksheet in the description below that has all the fabric requirements and cutting instructions so that you can get started on sewing all your blocks. And there is a link to a pre-quilt coloring page where you you can color the quilt playing with fabrics and colors and make it your own. To catch up with all the videos I've put a link in the corner to the playlist so that you can watch and sew along. And don't forget to stick around to the end of this video because I'm going to be sharing some ideas for how you could possibly quilt this. So let's get started finishing our quilt top. To sash the quilt and attach the borders you are going to need. For the sashing you are going to need eight two and a half by twelve and a half inch strips. For the sashing between rows you are going to need three two and a half by forty and a half inch strips. Now if your fabric is not wide enough to get a 40 and a half inch strip what you will need to do is cut a fourth strip and cut it into four pieces and then attach it to each one of those three other strips to give you a longer strip and then you can trim as required for the top and bottom borders you will need two three and a half inch by 40 and a half inch strips and again if your fabric is not wide enough to get 40 and a half inches from it you will need to cut a third strip and then join it to the other two strips and trim to size and then for the side borders you are going to need three five and a half inch by width of fabric strips and we are going to join those together to make larger strips now you can arrange these blocks any way that you like you can do it in the order that we were made or you can do it randomly I have chose to do mine like this because I wanted to distribute the blocks about so that the coat looks a little bit more balanced. Now whilst I don't pin when I'm attaching sashing to the side of the blocks, I will be pinning when I'm sewing sashing to the rows and when I'm joining rows together and attaching border. Long strips of fabric have a tendency to shift and move about the place and so pinning is one of the best ways to ensure that they don't go for a walk. So feel free to pin whenever you want, do whatever it is that makes you feel the most comfortable and let's get cracking. Okay we begin by giving all of our blocks a good press. Mine have been sitting in a pile so they're a little bit crumpled. Be careful not to stretch these, we just want them nice and flat and then once you've done that you are going to start placing these in the order of the rows take each pile for each row and put them in order and then take the first and second block from each row and then we are going to take those with the two and a half inch and tw by 12 and a half inch strips to the sewing machine where we are going to join these all with a careful quarter inch seam chain piecing these as we go. Now feel free to pin these or use clips to hold them together. I prefer to just place them and then adjust as I sew. And when I get to the end of it, I just butt the next one straight up and then sew it straight through. I do have guides here on my sewing machine that are helping me to keep a careful quarter inch seam. Chain piecing is really the most efficient way to do this. It saves you so much time. This footage is sped up just to save you watching it. And then you're going to snip these all apart and head towards the pressing station. Now with the ironing board you want to set that seam and then you want to roll it back and press the seam towards the sashing strip. And then press with your iron, I've got a few loose threads that I'm just getting rid of. And then we continue for each one of the blocks that we have just sewn the sashing to. Be careful not to stretch these. And then once we've done that, we are going to take the second block and we are going to attach the third block to the sashing. And then you are going to press the seam towards the sashing again. And I'm not going to show you sewing these just because of the length of the video, but here I am just pressing towards the sashing. And then I'm going to repeat this by taking the first block and attaching it to the second and third block units that we have just made, which you can see here. And make sure to get these in the right orientation here so that they don't get mixed up and they are in the right row and the right place that you want them to go. That will save you unpicking some seams. 
and then again chain piecing joining with a careful quarter inch seam pin or clip these if you prefer you can see i just keep the pile in my lap so that they're ready to go and i just adjust them as i'm sewing through do have a few loose threads here that i'm just trimming as i sew because they are sticking to my masking tape guide it's very quick when you chain piece them like this it saves you so much time again more loose threads and then we are setting the seam and pressing towards the sashing. Next up, we are taking each row and we are going to attach the row sashing strips to the bottom of these rows. So I am pinning these here because long strips do move about. So I just want to make sure that I get it as consistent as possible. Now, spot the mistake here, this row is the wrong way around, and I did not realize this until I had finished the quilt. But, however, never mind. These things happen, and it's just, you know, you just I needed to label my things better. So joining with a careful quarter and seam again is always chain piecing through, taking your time. I am wearing a quilting gov now, because this does help me to keep this just a little bit more stable when it's passing through. And there you can see I ran out of thread. So if that happens to you, just pick up a couple of stitches before where you ran out of thread, sew over and then backstitch to secure and then just sew off the end and then backstitch again. And that will help to keep it secure. I hate when that happens. Now, like everything we were doing today, we are just setting the seam first. I have moved to my ironing board because the rows are too wide for my little wool mat. However, my camera is now wobbling because of the actions. I do keep my quilting glove on because I find it helps give me a little bit of traction when opening the seams up. And I'm just gently pressing away from the seam to help open it up, being careful not to stretch this. Now I'm going to take the first and second row and I'm going to pin those together and then repeat for the third and fourth row before I sew them so that we can chain piece everything. Again, I'm pinning here, just making sure everything's nice and even because I don't want anything to move about. And I'm making sure definitely that I have the rows in the right order this time. You will see me using a leader before I sew. It's just a little piece of scrap fabric that helps with any tension issues on the sewing machine before it starts sewing at the main block. And even though these are pinned, I am stopping sewing and adjusting and then sewing on. I make sure I remove my pins before I sew over them so I don't break any of my needles. And then again, once this is finished, we are just going to press this towards the sashing. Now I have moved to a wool mat. This really isn't the best way to do this, but it's easier for me to film this without the camera wobbling. But ideally do this on the largest pressing surface that you have. Take your time here. Sometimes the seam doesn't want to go in the direction that you want to. You just have to manipulate it, as you can see with my fingers. Sometimes you even have to take your hand and stick it underneath the coat to push it in the right direction. And sometimes I've even had to start all over again because it just doesn't want to behave. And you can see here, this bit here, just giving me a few problems. But with a little bit of manipulation, a little bit of patience, it gets there in the end. There we go. Now you're going to take the first and second row unit, pin it to the third and fourth row unit, making sure you have them in the right direction. I'm saying that because of the mistake that I made, but I know that you'll all have them in the right direction because you will have labeled them beautifully. And again, careful quarter and seam, sewing down, adjusting as you go, taking your time. It's not a race. Don't rush, don't worry. You can sew as slow as you like or as fast as you like. Do whatever you feel the most comfortable with until you get to the end of the seam. This footage is sped up. I am not sewing this fast. I genuinely am taking my time and sewing nice and slow. And then just give that final press towards the sashing. Again, take your time, adjust as required. As I mentioned, you probably want to do this on a larger pressing surface than a little wool mat. And again, I'm just having a little bit of trouble with that seam, so I just put my hand underneath the coat to push it in the right direction. Just smoothing things out. The quilting glove gives you a little bit of traction to help you open the seam up. Take your time, really press this well, because it's really important to get this nice and flat. And there is the finished part of the quilt top, looking good. 
Now it's time for borders. So we are going to attach a three and a half inch by 40 and a half inch strip to the top of the quilt and to the bottom of the quilt. Now, as I mentioned in the instructions, if your fabric is not wide enough, you will have to cut another strip and make a pieced border for the top and bottom. It's very simple to do, just join the two strips together, similar to what we did for the left and right ones. Now, I like to make my strips just a little bit longer than the width of the quilt, just in case anything happens, so that I have a little bit of extra leeway. There is nothing worse than sewing a border on and discovering that you are half an inch short. So if you want, you can make your borders longer just to give you a little bit of space to play with, and then you can trim it afterwards. I am back stitching at the start and the end of each of these seams just to secure this because this is the last seam that will be sewn on the outside of this quilt. So I want to make sure that these are very secure and don't unravel. Now we are pressing towards the border and this is where it gets a little bit tricky because that quilt wants to slip and move all over the place. So I tend to just use my stomach to hold it in place on the ironing board so that it doesn't slip. As you can see here, it just wants to just fall on the floor. That's where the wool mats are really handy because they have some friction and stop things happening. But my ironing board cover is a bit slippy so it tends to just fall all over the place as you can see there. For the left and right borders, take the three width of fabric by five and a half inch strips, trim the selvages off, but keep one of the strips folded in half. Then cut a tiny little slither off the folded end to open it up and give you two pieces. Then take one of those pieces and attach it to each one of the remaining width of fabric strips, back stitching at the start and the end of the seam to secure. And then press your seam towards the smaller strip of fabric. Now you are going to take these and you are going to pin them to the left and right sides of the quilt. Now I just need to trim the little extra bit of my border from the top off and I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. So just keep watching to see that. Make sure you pin both borders before you start sewing. This will save you a lot of time. And my borders are bigger than the length of the quilt. This will give me space to trim in case there's any issues. Now again, you need to backstitch at the start and the end of this because that will help this not to unravel. I have had quilts that have unraveled on the edges where it's not being held in place by the binding and it's very frustrating trying to fix that. So this backstitching will help you with that. And just sew until you get to the end of the quilt and then backstitch and then sew off the end of the extra little bit of border if your borders are a little bit longer. Then repeat for the other side. And again, I just sew, adjust, remove the pin. Sew, adjust, remove the pin. Keeps it nice and even. Helps me get a good consistent quarter and seam. Now, here you go. So place this flat before we've pressed it and get a square ruler, line it up with the edge of the quilt and the top of the quilt, and then just make sure everything is lined up and then trim. And again, you can see that here, the square ruler lines up with the bottom of the quilt and the edge of the other border and then trim. And then again, line it up with the edge and the top of the quilt and then trim. And that's very easy and you can do that for all your borders when you cut them longer. Then give it a final press, pressing towards that border. Again, this is slipping all over the place on my stupid ironing board cover. Uh, but I did get there in the end. Just take your time. It's very easy to press these squints, so try not to swoosh. I'm trying to just press left to right and up and down to keep this as straight as I possibly can. Repeat for the other side and you are almost finished. Again, I'm using a quilting glove just to give me a little bit of traction to help open that seam up. It does make a little bit of a difference. Oops, turned the iron off there. Last little bit there and you can actually see that was a little bit squint until I ironed it and it straightened it out. And there we have the finished quilt top. Yay! Looks good. So that was how to put your quilt top together. I like to chain piece the blocks when I'm adding the sashing. So once I have everything laid out, I take a pile of the sashing and I take the blocks and I just sit and chain piece them through. I make sure though that I keep them laid out or keep them positioned or labeled in the order that they go because I find that I get very quickly mixed up and end up sewing things to the wrong places. So get yourself some post-it notes or a bit of masking tape, write the numbers on them so that you know 
the order or just make sure that they're laid out in a design wall or the floor so that you can make sure that you don't get mixed up. A great tip that I discovered as well is that when it comes to attaching long strips to rows of quilts and then joining those rows together, they do love to move and shift and pull all over the place. When I first started quilting, I found it very difficult to stay accurate with my quarter inch seam and it would be waving all over the place. So one of the ways that I've come to help me with that is to wear a quilting glove on my left hand. And I find that this gives me just a little bit better grip on holding that row in place. I don't wear one on the right hand though because I like to have that free, but the left hand does help me to stabilize it and keep it moving. Another thing that you'll notice is that I often stop and adjust when I'm sewing. I don't just fire through. I take my time. I do go slow, even though I want to sew fast. I go slow though so that I don't distort things. Things don't get stretched and pulled out of place and that I can get more accurate seam allowances. Now you may find that when you get to the end of your quilt top, your border is just a tiny bit longer. That's okay, don't panic. What you just need to do is take it to your cutting board, line a ruler up with the end of the block and cut it straight. Just make sure to line rulers up with the borders and with the lines on the block so that you do get a straight cut and it's not squint. If it is a little bit bigger though, that's okay. Don't worry about it, it's not a problem. I also do have a habit though of cutting these just a little bit bigger, whether it's a quarter to a half inch, just to give me a little bit of extra room just in case. So that's something that you can do and then once you've attached it, you can just trim it up to size. It's better to have a little bit too much than not enough. Now when it comes to the backing fabric, and backing can be so expensive because suddenly you need to buy four, five, six yards of fabric and make a piece top. So I'm always looking for the most economical way to do this without wasting fabric and without spending money that I don't need to spend. So I like to take the backing fabric and I like to fold it in half and then cut it in half so that I end up with two pieces that are with the fabric by half of the yardage. Then I like to join those together with a half inch seam. I don't bother to cut the selvages off because there's no need, they won't be seen. And then this is the only time you will see me do this, but I do press that seam open so that it lays nice and flat and I give it a good press with steam. When it comes to batting as well, probably the easiest way to do this is to either buy a pre-cut twin size batting that you can then just trim down to size. Or if you're looking to save a little bit of money, you can buy batting off the roll, go for a nice 90, 96 or 120 inch wide, whatever you can get. Buy enough of the yardage, cut it in half and then do some franken batting to sew it together to give you a bigger piece and that can save you a bit of money as well. Now let's take a look at a couple of ideas that we can use to quilt this quilt. So looking at our first quilting example, we have gone with a straight cross hatch and this consists of vertical and horizontal lines placed across the quilt to create a grid of squares. So to determine the width of the grid, we're looking for a whole number here. So that's a number that doesn't have a decimal. So for example, if we were to do a two inch grid, we would take a width of the quilt and divide it by two inches. So let's use the example of a 50 inch wide quilt. That would give us 25 lines, each spaced two inches apart. And that's a whole number. Whereas if I was to take a 50 inch wide quilt and divide it by a three inch grid, I would get 16.66666. So you're gonna end up with an uneven number of lines on the quilt. Now this may not matter to you, but if you like symmetry, you will want to make sure that this is a round number. So in this example, this is a two inch grid. And what I have done is started in the middle of the quilt and worked my way outwards so that I can make sure that it's as symmetrical as possible. Now looking at our second example, this is still a cross hatch, but this time we have taken it on the 45 degree angle. So to do this, when you've got your quilt top, get a ruler that has a 45 degree line on it, line that up with the edge of the quilt, and then you will find the ruler lies diagonally across the quilt. Mark it however you like. You can use chalk, pencils, whatever it is that you use to mark your fabric, or you can use masking tape and use that as your guideline. When I start to quote this one, it can be very easy to end up with the lines that are going off. Just ever so slightly squint as you get towards the end of the line. So what I do like to do is I like to mark and sew the first line in one direction. So for example, from left to right. And then I like to mark and sew the second line from right to left. And then I use these as registration lines and I mark the next line and then use the guide on my walking foot to try and keep this as straight as possible because it is very easy to go squint. I think though a diagonal cross hatch is probably one of my favorite designs to do in quilting, especially in very square blocky quilt designs. I feel like it adds movement in the opposite direction. So that's a great one and it's nice and quick and easy to do. Now for example three, I would call this an uneven cross hatch perhaps. 
Maybe there's a better name for that. But again, this is comprising of horizontal and vertical lines. However, this time, as opposed to having an evenly spaced grid, these are a little bit more bunched up in places. So if you look at the outside borders, what you can see is there's three horizontal lines on the top and bottom border, and there's three vertical lines in the left and right border. And then that has been mirrored through the vertical and horizontal sashing, and that gives nice uniformity through the sashing, and it makes the sashing really frame the quilt blocks very nicely. So every time you use wadding or batting, it will give you instructions for how far apart you can quilt it without slipping. And because these blocks are 12 inches wide, that's a bigger gap than most waddings or I think all waddings would recommend that you quilt them in. So what I've done is I've just taken a vertical line and I've gone down the middle of each column, straight through the middle of every block. And you'll want to mark that first to make sure that it's as straight as possible. And then I have done the same thing horizontally through the middle of each block. And again, you want to mark this to try and keep it nice and straight. And then I have taken lines to either side of the middle of the block. And then all I've done is I've added a line to the left and right side of the middle line in each column and in each row. And so what happens is you end up with three vertical lines through the block and three horizontal lines through each block. So there's lots of symmetry here. It's three lines, three lines, three lines, but it gives a nice texture to this quilt and it's not too busy through the middle of the quilt block. So it doesn't take away too much of the detail of the quilt. And I do like how the slightly denser border and sashing helps to frame these blocks. So that's nice and easy and nice and quick to do, but you will want to make sure that you mark these lines to try and keep them nice and straight. Next up is the good old meander. Now this is just free motion quilting where you're making a meandering path all over the top of the quilt top in one continuous line. So this is just my rough approximation of what a meander stitch would look like. Now why this is quite nice is because this is a very square and blocky designed quilt. So the meandering stitches, the roundness of them, softens the blockiness and just contrasts it quite nicely. So something to maybe consider trying, you could make quite a large spaced apart meander quilt. That would give the quilt a softer texture because there's less quilting in it. Or you could go for a slightly more dense, closer together pattern that would give the quilt a slightly stiffer feel to it. Now, for example number four, this is a vertical zigzag. Now, not a zigzag as in the zigzag stitch on your sewing machine. This is zigzag lines that we have marked ourselves. Now, similarly, in the way that we worked out the crosshatch, so we had evenly spaced lines and symmetry from left to right, you'll want to do a bit of work here to make sure that you have some symmetry. And you'll just basically freehand a line down the center of your quilt using a ruler and whatever it is that you use to mark your quilt and just draw from the top of the quilt down to the left at an angle and then flip the ruler around and draw down towards the right and then flip and continue to draw down the quilt until you have a zigzaggy line. Once you're happy with that, you're going to stitch it and then you're just going to mirror it across the quilt. Now, I particularly like this design. I think it's quite nice. One thing I haven't quite managed to do though in my little illustration here is get symmetry on that left hand side. You can see there's just a little bit of a gap there, which ideally you wouldn't have. You would have it filled in more like the right hand side. But I do like this. I think this is a really nice, interesting variation on the quilt. I have ideas to try this perhaps not on this quilt top, but on another quilt top that I've had lying for a while to see how this turns out. But again, this is really very simple walking foot design that can be done nice and quickly, just taking a bit of time to mark out how you want to lay things out. Now, final design is a horizontal zigzag. So this is all done exactly the same as the vertical zigzag, except on the horizontal. And I have to say, I really like this. I think it's going to look really smart. And this is actually how I am going to quilt my finished quilt. I love the movement it gives across the quilt. I love the contrast that you feel to the blockiness of the quilt design. And I love the movement that this will create across the quilt. Again, though, just thinking about how densely you quilt this, the more dense that you quilt something, the stiffer it feels, the further apart the quilting is, the softer it feels. But always pay attention to what your batting tells you as the maximum stitch width as in how far apart you can have lines of quilting. So I think for this, I would probably want to go for maybe a three inch, four inch gap between the lines, just so that the quilt retains a little bit of softness and cuddliness. I don't particularly want something too stiff if it's gonna be a blanket for cuddling in. And that was our quilting designs. So we have come to the end. You've seen me make all the 12 quilt blocks and you've seen me give you examples of all the quilts that you can make using them. You've seen me sashing and joining all the rows and adding borders together. And then finally, you've seen some ideas on how to quilt this. 
I think this turned out beautifully. I'm really, really happy with this and I am looking forward to getting it quilted. If you wanted to make this quilt a little bit bigger, do feel free to add more borders to the outside of this until you get to the size that you're looking for. Don't forget there are worksheets in the description that have everything you need to know about sashing and everything you need to know about making the entire sample quilt and you can download those for free from my website in the links below. I really hope you have been sewing along and I look forward to seeing all your blocks and finished quilts on Instagram. So use the hashtag BTB season one and tag me the colorblind quilter so that I can look and see what you've been up to. I have really enjoyed making this series and I started this two years ago and I really hope that you have enjoyed sewing along and seeing all the tips and tricks that I've been sharing as we construct these blocks. Now for season two of Behind the Blocks, we are going to be looking at things that involve triangles and geese. So blocks that are made with seams on the bias. So we are upping our skill levels again. And again, there will be 12 blocks and we'll be making a beautiful sampler quilt. I also have lots of other great content that's going to be coming out in 2022. So I do hope you'll be following along with me on YouTube and Instagram. If you found this video helpful, please do consider giving it a thumbs up and make sure that you are subscribed and you click that bell so you will get notified when I release more videos and when season two of Behind the Blocks kicks off. So that's it for me from Behind the Blocks season one. I will see you in the next video. And until then, take care.